Welcome to another episode of the Eat to Live podcast. I'm here with my dad, Dr. Furman. Hi, great to be here. I'm here with my daughter, Jenna. And the topic we are going to be talking about today is about sunshine, sunscreen, vitamin D, and calcium. Is that right, Dr. Furman? And osteoporosis. Oh, and osteoporosis. So that's a lot of topics, but they're kind of intertwined and all go together. Right. They're okay. all wrapped together. So let's talk about it's summer, it's July. People are loving sunbathing right now, being outside. Summer's in the air. Just makes people feel a certain type of way. So is sunshine good for us? Should we be out in the sun? Well, that's really what I wanted to discuss. This idea that um, some sun is very healthy and good for us, and too much sun can be harmful. And how do we um, weigh how much sun to get, what time of day, how much to get? I want people to be very clear with the recommendations so they can maximize their lifespan. Right. What I'm saying here is pretty something unusual. I'm saying that we can maximize our lifespan, add our, to our longevity, add to our immune system, add to the anti-cancer benefits of a healthy diet with the proper use of sunshine. Mm -hmm. pretty, okay, so I mean, typically when you're thinking about healthy eating and a healthy lifestyle, you're not like, oh, and sunshine. Yeah, exactly. But you're saying it really does matter. Yeah, it does. It can help a lot. And we're saying that like the light-dark cycles, the circadian ryth rhythms, Play, just like food rhythms. You don't want to eat before bedtime. You don't want to get the right sunshine in relation to your food, in relation to your life, as all matters. So the first thing I'm saying is that the infrared light is most um, absorbable and, and from, comes from sunshine in the morning hours. When, for, when it first gets bright out, like between 6.30 and 9 in the morning, or well, 7 and 9 in the morning. that's my favorite time of day. Right. So the infrared is the most healing part of sunshine, and that exposure to infrared um, also stops the production of melatonin, which you want to have happen. So you produce mostly serotonin during the day because you want to consolidate your melatonin at night. And if you stay indoors and don't get exposed to infrared in the morning, melatonin production could continue into daylight hours. So you're advising us to be outside early. Exactly. So it's not always the brightest sun, the strongest sun. That's the best for us. That's right. By 10 o'clock, you have... UVA coming in, and then by 12 o'clock, you have UVB. UVB is the, is the sunshine that burns you mm -hmm. and raises your vitamin D the most, but that has the potential for more damage. Right. And it's not the type of sunshine that's really going to heal you, even though it's going to, the healing rays of sunshine, emotionally healing and immune system supporting, those most beneficial sun, um, sun products come in the early morning sun. Okay, so, so I'm, I'm not trying to get like super deep into the science, but you mentioned melatonin and serotonin. Uh -huh. So melatonin is that hormone, that chemical that helps us sleep. Yes. Exactly. What is it? A hormone? Yeah, hormone. it's a neurohormone. Neurohormone. Okay. And then serotonin, that makes us happy, right? It elevates our mood and it makes us more alert. Okay. So those kind of go through our body or, or are more elevated at different times of day? Yes. You're, um, if you're not getting sunshine in the morning then you're allowing melatonin production to continue into daylight hours, wow. which doesn't consolidate your melatonin to a peak in the evening around 9 o'clock at night to make you go to sleep. So you might have a harder time falling asleep and staying asleep mm -hmm. because you allowed melatonin, because there's almost so much melatonin the body can produce. And you don't want to produce it at night and during the day, you just want to produce it at the time at night. And consolidating your melatonin is associated with lower rates of cancer. Oh, wow. So if you expose yourself to wake up to use a computer or your phone, you turn the lights on, or you're going to bed very late and watching TV through the night and then sleeping through the daylight hours, those things are not good for your long-term health. Because they're messing up that... It's, it's messing up this combination of consolidating your neurohormones. So you have a good spike of melatonin consolidated when you're sleeping and a good, like, nice lift of serotonin when you're in daylight hours. You don't want to mix them together and have it all be flat. What's if that it, called? Circadian... Circadian rhythm. Yes, right. I've the heard circadian of Circadian rhythm is important. And, and, you know, we talked about it in an, early po in an earlier podcast about gardening being effective for longevity. For sure. So now I'm adding something additional and saying one reason gardening is effective for longevity is you people wake up and garden before the sun gets too bright and you start to get burning. So the first thing you do when you get up in the morning is you go outside and you work in your garden mm -hmm. and you don't wear sunscreen because you want the skin to be exposed to UV. I was going to ask that. Yeah. So because... I, you know, since I was a little kid, you've been warning me about getting sunburned. You know, you've been like a stickler for sunscreen. You wear every hat, Not sunscreen protection. I don't put a hat on until nine o'clock in the morning. Oh, so it's actually. No hats, okay. no sunglasses, no sunscreen. Really? Early morning. 
you want the natural UV red to get on your skin and into your eyes. Because I was going to ask, like, I kind of try to avoid the sun like the plague to keep my skin in good condition. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm hiding under a beach umbrella and stuff like that. But in the morning, it's like, let it rip. The morning, it protects your skin. It actually makes when you get the UV red light. You know how oh those, they're all in the, va the Vogue now, these red lights people yeah. are going under? I didn't like, know you read Vogue. <laughs> I, in Vogue. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but so these... Yeah, and like the fa red face lights. The red they're, face lights. They're supposed to be anti-aging and stuff like that. You're saying there's truth to that. You yes, know? they're anti-aging mm -hmm. in the sense that it protects your skin against wrinkling. It's the exposure to later light in the day, the UVB, but most the UVA, most the UVB that wrinkles your skin. Oh, I'm but shocked. the morning infrared light makes the skin more resistant to wrinkling and has anti-aging effects. Oh, so you don't want to wear, just like cataracts, inc you increase your risk of cataracts when you get too much exposure to later day sun, which too much UVB, and then you are, want to wear a hat with a brim so your head's in the shade, or sunglasses if you're not wearing a hat with a brim, or right. both, to keep yourself from getting the, those UVB lights in your eyes, but not in the morning. In the morning, you want the infrared to protect you, to raise melatonin, and protects you against skin cancer, protects you against cataract, and supports immune function. You're saying it's even good for your eyes in even the morning. Even good for your eyes and your skin. Because something that you said that surprised me was, you know, you always said wear a hat, and I really try to wear a hat. But because I have a hat on a lot of the time, I'm not the biggest sunglasses person. Yeah, me neither. But you're saying it. You want to protect your eyes in that if you're out in the middle of the day, if you're outside and it's really bright. It well, is I don't wear sunglasses because I have a big brim hat. Right. So my eyes are getting covered in the shade. My eyes are in right. the shade. Um, but if I'm you more, didn't, sun sunglasses are... If I did, if a, a lot of women don't wear hats, they wear sunglasses instead. And they're wearing makeup that has sunscreen in it. Mm -hmm. So they're just wearing sunglasses, which is okay. So either a hat or sunglasses or both in the, day, in the heat of the day, in the hot of the day, but not in the morning. Because you're not going to get the longevity effects of sun and the infrared that you're not supposed to cover your eyes for. You want it to come in through the eyes. Kara so, actually told me that women are getting lower rates of skin cancer because their makeup has sunscreen in it too. And we put it on every single day. So that's actually protecting your skin. And that men are having, who don't ever wear makeup or anything on their face are getting more damage. Let's talk about that. Because um, your risk of getting skin cancer is proportional to the amount of times you've been sunburned in your life. So you want to avoid ever being burned by the sun. And too much tanning of your skin and too much darkening of your skin obviously leads to more wrinkling of your skin too. So we want to avoid the UVB light, but it's the UVB light after 12 noon, between 12 and 3 it's at the highest, that gives you the most vitamin D formation. Mm. And vitamin D formation, so we're saying here that the optimal protection for the bones and the immune system to protect against cancer and against infection is to have the vitamin D blood test to be between like 30 and 45. That's okay. the blood test result. Got it. And because of, we're trying to ba be balanced with the conservative use of sunshine and the conservative use of supplements. We're not avoiding all sunshine and then having to take a high dose supplement, which is we're not taking the a lot of sun and then avoiding use of all supplements. We're right. balancing out a little sun. And you get a lot of vitamin D production from just if you're a Caucasian, just five minutes of sunshine, five under 10 really? minutes gives you a, a huge amount of vitamin D. So it's okay to go out in the sun without sunscreen under 10 minutes. In between in, 12 and 3? In between 12 and 3. That's and what if you're, if you're um, black, you can take, then it's double, the, they need double the amount of sunshine to get the same amount of vitamin D formation. So they're getting um, 15 to 25 minutes or 20 minutes of sunshine. Let's say we're goal is to get 10 minutes of sunshine. That's it for the day. We'll get plenty of vitamin D proportion because more than that will cause skin damage between 12 and 3. Right. So it's like a little and, bit, not enough to cause damage, but a little bit to be like, hey, I'm here. That's correct. I'm getting some vitamin D. Yeah. So I'll go out for a swim, let's say. Yeah. Where we'll go without sunscreen on. Because I'm always yeah. trying to hide. I mean, you yeah. you were so adamant that we were going to get burned and ruin our skin. Yeah, because you're out all day long. Yeah. You're I, out for yeah, hours I, and hours. It's true. I can't know, get enough. And people are getting burnt and damaging their skin and causing yeah. wrinkling. Yeah. You know? Well, uh. with vitamin D, we we need to supplement it as well. You don't recommend that we only get it from the sun. Because we and don't... It's not enough, right? It probably would be enough if you lived in California all year or lived in the sunshine state. Right. But across the country, people don't get enough from sun exposure. And how regimented and careful am I to always get, you know, 10 minutes of sun during the day. I'm working, you know, indoors. So we take the vitamin D supplement in addition to getting the judicious use of sunshine to keep our level in that perfect range right. between 30 and 45. And the little bit of sun prevents us from having to use too much vitamin D supplementation. You don't want to be really having people using 3,000, 4,000, 5,000, 10,000, which other people are recommending. I'm recommending people take 
2,000 because that gets you the then you have and and then if you're in the winter time you're not living in the in the in California you're living within rainy states more indoor states yeah, colder sure. states then they can get making sure that vitamin D is in that range all year right so we use supplements and sunshine both but even if you lived in a in the a climate like New York or Canada or Montreal let's say you still want to get morning sun outdoors as much as you can when the weather permits right so you're saying it's, are it's you encouraging not, people to bundle up be like wear heavy jackets go out jackets. for a morning walk yeah. yeah but if you can't so you have three or four months of the year you're not getting out that much right but you're still doing it when you can when the weather's nice sure so this because it has a beneficial effect so what do you recommend for those other months well for people who are light dependent who don't do well without light they can use a, a light they can use a light box yeah but for other rest of people, they can just take be, be there taking the vitamin D supplements. Right, make sure not to miss yeah. those. Not, and and uh, you think taking those 2,000 2, IU is that it? Two thousand yes. IU of vitamin D throughout the whole year is good. Like, can you get? Is it harmful to get too much vitamin D? Not really. Okay. It, not if you're not not if you're not overdoing supplements because you don't get too much from the sun. Right. And so it'll keep you that that's kind of like a con, like a, a optimal conservative dose. So you're not going to ever a, really overdo it. It's an optimal it. conservative dose, right? Got you it. don't overdose it. So that's we're trying we're trying to have people not need to take high dose vitamin D because we're saying it's not good to drive your level up too high. Right. And keep in mind that the that the after you get five or ten minutes, we're saying five minutes of sun exposure, but yeah. for a person to produce a, real, a good amount of vitamin D in the skin, the oils on the skin have to stay on the skin for hours after the sun exposure. So you came indoors after your sun exposure and took a shower with soap and wiped the oils off your skin, you wouldn't get the benefit of the vitamin D absorption. You wow. have to not shower after being outdoors. Got it. That's how uh, they did a study on surfers in Hawaii, uh -huh. and they found that when they came in, they, they were vitamin D deficient. They followed these Caucasian surfers in Hawaii they, because they came in off the beach and they would get into the showers and they washed with soap. And even though they're out there for an hour, they still didn't get enough vitamin D. So it has to stay on for hours, like not even right. one hour, 30 minutes is okay. That's why I only shower once a month, whether I need it or not. <laughs> I mm. knew that joke was coming here. <laughs> okay. You like go, yeah, smelly, sweaty, and not mm. showered. Perfect. Right, yeah. yeah. So nice. Mom will be so proud. And now I'm looking for a scientific reason why I convince Lisa why it's okay to leave the toilet seat up. <laughs> I'm sure you're looking through all the evidence. <laughs> no doubt about that. I remember what I was going to say. Finally, okay. um, you're actually really inspiring me. So when I lived in Hawaii, I would, it was too hot to really go out. And I loved walking and it was just too hot to go out at noon. Like no one wants to walk at noon in Hawaii. It just isn't fun. So I would go out at 630 and that's when I would take my morning walk and I would wear a hat. I wish I did it now, but I would wear a hat, but I kind of stopped doing that. And I wake up now and I just get right to my work. And that's just so not productive to my whole life. Like right. that's not what I should be doing. And when you take that walk after lunch to get the real vitamin D, yeah, then you should wear a hat, right? Because then you don't want the sun beating in your eyes, because then you're high risk of cataracts, right? And you don't want the sun. You see my wrinkling around my eyes from all the sunshine from exposure. You still look handsome. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so the um, so you that's what you want to wear a hat, but you want forty percent of your skin exposed when you're going for that five or ten minutes. So you want to have like. Um, be on shorts, uh, you know, your sleeves open. Oh, so you're you saying know. like you could wear a hat, cover your face, but still get getting that vitamin D through your legs, body. It doesn't right. have to be at your face. Like right. you could wear sunglasses. A tank top, no shirt, it's shorts. Good to know. And but don't but say it, hit me, mother. Go out nude, but wear a hat. <laughs> so you cover your. If you're going out, this it's really good to do that, right? If anyone gets arrested, they come after you. <laughs> Public indecency. I told them it was okay to go out to walk around. They're Although, not nude as long as they're wearing a hat. Although it's good for you, I don't think the people are ready for that. Okay. I don't think civilization is ready for nude uh, sunbathers. I don't think civilization is ready for any of my advice. <laughs> <laughs> you know, people are slowly changing. I don't know. I see a bunch of restaurants popping up that you really would be proud of the food. Okay, so we hit the vitamin D, we hit the sunshine, sunscreen. I know, I know you do recommend sunscreen, but I feel like you typically wear sun shirts and hats. Yeah, I don't use that much sunscreen because I'm wearing, I'm totally covered. Right. You know, during those days when I'm out, because I'm outdoor playing tennis, I'm going for an hour hike. Yeah. I'm not doing five or ten minutes of sun. I'm out for hours. Right. So then we want to either be covered with clothing, um, and have the hats to cover the back of your neck too, and your face, and and even your hands. Should be covered. Oh my! I'm yeah. always thinking about the my hands. Of your hands. They have yeah. gloves now, which, like, I mean, even yeah, when sun gloves are even important. when so 
women now are getting nails done and they put them under this UV light. I don't know if it's A or B or whatever it is, yeah. but I'm watching certain people now are bring gloves to their appointment. They have like sun gloves that I think right. are really worthwhile because your hands are always exposed. Right, and you get these like, what are they called? Um, solar lenticles or aging spots in your hand and your mm. hands get all wrinkly when you get older. Yeah, and if because, you can preserve it, why not? Right. Slow why not down just, aging. Yeah. It's totally. anti-aging to protect your skin. Yeah. And then... Uh, you were mentioning that women have less skin cancer, Kara said, because if they wear makeup with sunscreen in it. SPF. And I'm saying those sunscreen ingredients like the octibenzone, oxybenzone and oxytocone, those things are absorbed into the bloodstream and are endocrine disruptors and are, can increase risk of cancer, like right. breast cancer. So those sunscreens are dangerous and people don't recognize that. And even you're even like Sean, who can go skiing with it, um, in the summertime with no top on and put those chemical sunscreens all over his body and instead of using the mechanical sunscreen. Right. Because he's putting it all over his body with no shirt on. And there's these chemical sunscreen rubbing all over the place and staying outdoors all day and reapplying the sunscreen. Mm -hmm. That's not good for your health. I know. You've been mm -hmm. really, you've been advocating for physical sunscreen for a long, long time. I mean, I think you've been selling it on your website for over 10 years. But people, are, people really are catching on and learning about that. So there's chemical sunscreen and there's physical sunscreen. So the ingredients you were mentioning in, in makeup, which are, is not in my makeup. Is chemical ingredients, but I have titanium okay. dioxide, zinc oxide in mine. Oh, your your son, your makeup does not have um, oxybenzone in it. It has like twenty percent. I think it's like twenty something zinc oxide. Twenty percent zinc oxide. Okay. Yeah, and I mean this thing is like it's once it's on, I do not get any color. So it's there's two mechanical sunscreens that are safe, and that's titanium dioxide and zinc oxide. And a lot of them are a combination of both, but yeah, and zinc oxide is most effective. That's the best sunscreen, zinc oxide. Okay, cool. Let's that, go IT Cosmetics. That, that's good. Yeah. And then, because the uh, chemical makeups and the chemical sunscreens people are using, and the spray sunscreens that get into your lung, too, are all not healthy. It for gets you. into your lungs? Yeah, but you're spraying them in the air, and you're inhaling sunscreen in your lung. Oh. These things are really so crazy. if it's zinc oxide, are you always good, or can it be like nanoparticles or stuff that also is not good and gets seeped into the bloodstream? That's right. They're showing some... See, the reason why the zinc oxide works is it coats the skin. It doesn't let the sun penetrate. So, but the, but you can go in through the skin. See, people like the fact that when they, they like it nanoparticles, they like it to go in clear because the not, the not, the non nanoparticle, the non small particles stay on your skin and leave like a white coating. Right. And well, people also don't it, like that. It that's stains why, your clothes. It like, stains your clothing. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. Yeah. Who wants to be like a white face when yeah. you're trying, like you just covered with that schmutz when you're trying to look yeah. cute at the beach. Yeah. It gives you a little ghost like. Yeah. whiteness yeah but that's yeah. the safest kind of sunscreen yeah is to not care what how you look and to put the um the non nanoparticle zinc oxide based sunscreen on and that's the one we have the cabala um green screen we sell on the website because we've researched all the sunscreens and that has no nanoparticles right it's a non nano but people don't like it because it makes your skin have that like that light white tone, mm -hmm. you know, or they have the skin colored ones the skin for certain ones. for and certain it, skin and colors. And what's good, you can but... see the light little white tone because if you rub it in, if the white tone is gone, then you're not getting good protection. Mm. And I'm not saying people have to do that; they can wear clothing, but they can. Um, but if you're out for a long time and you're out swimming and you're out, you want a sunscreen like that's going to stick on your skin, not going to wash off with water. I'm in the ocean. We're surfing. We're not going to have put clothing on, or right. we're doing something like that. Yeah. Or I'm, you know, I want to be out there hiking without a shirt or something. I want a lot have of the that. really good surfers always have that like white nose because they yeah, just they want do. a lot of protection. They do not care. Oh, the surfers they with the white stuff on their cheek. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like some of them just will like slap it on and they don't care. They're there to be in the water. But yeah, yeah I mean, other surfers get just a ton of sun. Like you can feel it, especially in Southern California, just like beat Especially on the you. back of your neck if you're on a surfboard. Yeah, you know? yeah. Guys struggle with that too. I notice they always have that like tan there. I bought a surf hat. I bought a hat that yeah. will stays on your head that's waterproof that you can surf with that covers the back of your neck. Yeah. When I surf. So I mean you have you have a ton of crazy hats. Like we can yeah. we could show <laughs> we should show people I what, your, all my different hats. Yeah, <laughs> what your hat wardrobe looks like. It's crazy. Yeah. But you do have some good sun protection. I guess you love being outside. Yeah. Who wanna, doesn't? Yeah. It really is. So like I mean, you talked about all the physical reasons that the sun is so good for us, but I mean, is there there's additional reasons just why it's so good for our mental health too. Yes, and also what I'm saying is there's benefits to sunshine outside of its effect on vitamin D production. And that's what we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. There's other neurological, neuropeptide, and biological effects to uh, that's, that's anti-aging. Red light therapy from sunshine is anti-aging right. and protects you. So we're talking about adding to the little things that could add to your um, 
overall health program. That's just fascinating to me because I know that I feel better whenever I go outside. And the more time I make to go for walks, I'm just in a better mood. Like everything just feels, I, I sleep easier. Everything just feels better. So I mean, now that there's all this evidence, you you really do, you should make time for it in your life. I know everyone right. gets busy, but you, you have to make time for it. It's just our health is our most precious gift. Yeah. Work on your, Love work on your, you. um, morning, work on your guard in the morning. Go out mm -hmm. for morning walks, mm -hmm. get sunshine whenever you can, and then just be out midday just for a couple, just for five minutes or just for a little yeah. bit. And then when I'm outside working in the garden during the day or being outdoors for a long period of time, then I'm well covered and well protected. And let me just say this podcast is the per perfect thing to listen to when you're gardening on your morning walks. Like we mm -hmm. want you to be doing something that we're telling you to do while you listen to this. It's just, it'll, you'll be feeling so good and inspired. So why not? Cool. cool. Okay, calcium. Yeah, let's talk about calcium, osteoporosis, vegan diets, things like that now. I remember you talking about calcium and you're like, people are very obsessed with calcium, but it's actually vitamin D that works really well to build strong bones. Is that true? Um, well, no, it's being too low on anything could weaken your bones. Too low in vitamin D, too low in vitamin K, too low in vitamin in, in calcium, whatever you're low in, too low in protein could weaken your bones. And having strong, being not strong enough, not being exercising. One thing we're nutritarians because we want to stay younger and fitter and stronger as we age and we can do this without eating a lot of animal protein to keep our muscles strong because a nutritarian diet is a protein rich diet mm -hmm. it's a protein rich plant-based diet that's the right. secret to longevity is being on a protein rich or protein adequate plant-based diet can i just say what's interesting is Yes, you, you said protein-rich diet, then you said protein-rich plant-based diet, but what you showed me on, on this little graph that you were working on is that it is a pretty protein-rich diet. Is that true? Yeah, yeah. let me um, bring, introduce that segment by stating, by starting with this 2020 Oxford study from Europe, from England, mm -hmm. showing that vegans followed for 17 years had a much higher rate of hip fracture and osteoporosis compared to the meat eaters in England. And so there was some concern that vegans have higher risk of um, hip fracture, that, that the vegan diet is causing osteoporosis. Right, right. right. And so I analyzed the diets they were eating in that study, on the, the vegans were eating compared to the meat eaters. And the vegans were eating about 13% of calories from protein. And their calcium consumption was about, was under 500, Ca uh, milligrams of calcium a day and compared to the meat eaters in that study we're eating about 18 percent we're eating the 13 percent for the vegans and about 16 percent of protein in the diet for the meat eaters right okay so they jumped up like three percent of their 3%, total diet three, eight, it was actually 18.5 percent for the meat eaters okay pull out your yeah. pull out your numbers let me check let me check if it's right right 13% for the vegans, 16.5% okay. for the meat eaters. That's what I thought. 16.5%. Right. Vegans, right. So they weren't that high in protein. Right. Yeah. Only like 3% more, which you would think, I mean, it's so much more. This yeah. is, I mean, you, you hear constantly, which I don't know how much of that, now I'm questioning how much of that is just propaganda, that mm. meat is the highest protein food. You well, want a rich protein diet? Meat, 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 meat. Well, that's because, look, these people, because let's put this in perspective now, 13% for the vegans, 16.5% for the meat eaters. Let's analyze the protein on a nutritarian diet. Same amount of calories that they were eating there, about 1,600 calories. And I analyzed the nutritarian diet and found that it gave you about 18.5 to 20% protein. More than, it gave you more protein on a nutritarian diet than the meat eating diet, and much more than it had almost double the protein grams compared to the vegan diets in England were eating. The first time you told me that, I really found it incredulous. Like, I now, almost didn't believe it. Now, how does a nutritarian diet have more protein than a meat-based diet? Exactly. Than, than a carnivore diet. Like, Well, not during a carnivore diet. Oh. This is just people who are eating meat. Okay, this because, is just meat in the diet. Yeah, because like, they're eating, because they dilute the protein in their diet because they're eating oil, which has no, see, the minute you put oil as a source of protein, what if I have, like, if my diet has 1,500 calories in it, and I eat 500 calories from oil, then I took out a third of the calories that could have had protein, because that's what people are eating, 500 calories of oil a day. Right. They're eating 1,500 calories with 500 calories of oil in it. They right. just wiped out half the fat, they just wiped out a third of the protein in their diet. So, so when you're, they're eating white flour, sugar, sweeteners, soft drinks, pasta, you know, sugar, oils, they're getting so much, even when they're eating meat or chicken, they're getting so much extra food with zero protein. And empty calories. Empty calories. Yeah. On a vegetarian diet, 
everything you're eating has protein in it. Right. Everything has some level of protein. Because you're not using oil. Yeah. And you're using more. So I compared the vegan diet they ate to the vegan to a low, high carbohydrate, starch based vegan diet with minimal, with no nuts and seeds and with and some amount of beans. And that had, compared to a nutritarian diet, with more nuts and seeds and more beans and more green vegetables. Right. Which <laughs> increases the protein content so dramatically that it had double the amount of protein compared to the high starch or low nut and seed, low bean, you know, which is some of these um, nutritional gurus in the plant-based community are very into like low fat, not eating nuts and seeds, which is totally crazy. Right. That's so crazy and they to me. It. Yeah. Oh. And, and some people are into eating oils. Mm -hmm. So they have all these different different groups within plant-based eaters. You mm -hmm. know, some use oils, some use no fat, some use nuts and seeds, right? And vegan does not necessarily mean healthy. Like Even that whole is, food vegan could not be healthy. Even whole right. food plant-based I mean, there's not, a ton. You, know. you walk through Whole Foods, there's a ton of processed foods in, in yeah. that are marketed as healthy or vegan. Like, you have yeah. to be kind of a detective and read the ingredients to really understand what you're eating. And that's the best part of a vegetarian diet. You're mixing so many different fruits, vegetables, beans, nuts, seeds, like so many of Mother Nature's foods... Right. That it's giving you just all good levels of fat, great levels of fat, protein, and you need, and you need though, your high. So, I mean, some people were saying 80, 10, 10, like these nutrition, these famous nutritional vegans who were advocating 80, 10, 10, which like means 80% an, carbohydrates, 10% fat, 10% protein. Okay. And the nutritarian guys, it gives you is more like 60, 20, 20. 60% carbohydrates, 20% protein, 20% fat. Correct. Correct. Got it. Yeah. yeah, like I, I I'm just going to go off about healthy fats. I love avocados. I love nuts and seeds. It makes right. me feel so satiated, ready to end a meal. So yeah, I want to have ice cream at night. Uh, heck yeah. <laughs> with bananas and macadamia nuts and some real vanilla bean powder. Yeah, give me full. all the ice cream. Yeah. Why? Like, I mean, we don't have, obviously, we eat good fats and we don't have extra excess. Like we're in a good body fat percent range. So where, why, what's their con? Well, they, they're just basing it on in ignorance and, and old studies. Like there were studies showing like people ate muffins versus oil, that when you had the same amount of calories from muffins versus oil in like a 1990 study, the people at oil were heavier. Yeah. So they're feeding fat made people heavier. So they're like, eat the carbs, not yeah. the fat. Right. So they stay on carbs, not fat. But right. those studies are not held up when people eat nuts and seeds instead of muffins. When people eat um, and not oil, when you're comparing fat from nuts and seeds, yeah. then when you take an equal amount of carbohydrate, rice, potato, to an equal amount of calories from nuts and seeds, not oil, you get more weight loss than you would have if you had more carbohydrate in the diet. Same amount, of cal isocaloric, same amount of calories, really? more nuts and seeds, more fat in the diet. Yeah. So, that's, so there's a lot of um, nonsensical myths being propagated and repeated over and over again by a lot of a nutritional famous nutritional vegans, right. you know what I mean? Because I mean, I, and on Instagram, social media, all these nutrition, like now places to consume nutrition content, yeah. it's like whoever is the loudest is is the most correct, and yeah. that's just not true. Yeah, so they think they say like, eating fat's gonna make you fat, stuff like that. I just yeah. like to remind people, I feel like there's such good education in books. Like read an entire book, don't just like take in like a quick 30 second video mm -hmm. if you're really looking for that education. But so you're not even advocating like what I love. You're not like, oh, all fat, all this, all that. You're saying like, hey, there's three macronutrients that, you know, we're talking about eating, carbohydrates, right. fat, protein. Right. And you're just advocating for a more balanced version. Absolutely. And when, you know, when you balance it out with nuts and seeds and beans and green vegetables and you're not eating, um, afraid of eating any nuts, any fat or anything, you also increase the calcium content in the diet. And these vegans in, in England were eating, you know, bread and oil and stuff like that. And so I compared the nutritarian diet to the one used in the study, which had, and the one, and to a starch-based or a heavy potato rice-based um, vegan whole food plant-based diet, and the, it had half the calcium. 600 milligrams of calcium compared to 1,300 milligrams of calcium on a, on a nutritarian diet with 1,600 calories. Same amount of calories, just a little tweaking in the food, adding seeds and beans and, mm -hmm. and not so much bread and pasta and bread, I mean bread and whole, bread, rice and Potatoes. potato, yeah, yeah. potato and rice mostly. I didn't even have bread, just potato and rice and more. Less beans, less greens, less nuts and seeds. You take all the calcium, you take all the protein, and your diet is not as prom um, lifespan promoting because the studies also show that you have increased risk of atrial fibrillation when your fats, when your ALA gets too low, alpha lenalenic acid. What's atrial fibrillation? It's an irregular heartbeat, the very common irregular heartbeat that people get when they get older. Okay. And I'm saying that the that walnuts and flax seeds and chia seeds um, have in them a, a, a fat called ALA, alpha lenalenic acid. 
that stabilizes the heart against irregular heartbeat. Wow. So protect so, you later in your later life. Protect you with irregular heartbeat and tremendous protective effects. The exclusion, taking nuts and seeds out, makes you more likely to develop an irregular cardiac rhythm. Whoa. You know. I mean, you're serious when you're telling people to eat nuts and seeds. Yeah, I think because yeah. I'm serious and I'm not going to um, scale that back because I, all these people have a large voice in the plant-based community and they're actually giving people advice that's not, that's, I say it's hurtful. Well, it's still better advice than they're getting from the conventional eaters and the yeah. conventional yeah. people eating keto. Sure. They're still pushing people in a healthier direction. But you need to advocate what... But, it, but it's all what you're comparing it to. If I'm gonna, My niche is to tell people what's best. Not mm -hmm. just what's better than the way other people are eating. For sure. You know, and, and why have any risk? Why have a risk of it? Why not? You know, to me, you're selling a person out if you're not giving all the little nuances that are important to maximize their chance to live to be 100 years old without, yeah. without medical problems. And kind of changing. I mean, nutrition is such a new early field that's just really getting the attention it deserves right. of recent times. And I feel like you are so not afraid to change, tweak, be like, yeah, I'm kind of saying this now. And I think that's so cool. Yeah. You have so to. that's why you're always coming out with like blogs and stuff like that. I just think, and I mean, f for example, you always told me as a kid, stay out of the sun and like, don't get skin damage, right? Because we were always in it. But I heard that for so long and I listened and now I'm like, now I get to, you know, go in the sun a little more and not wear a hat. Yeah. Like now right. I'm just going to tweak my healthy living lifestyle. And I'm excited to do that. Right. I yeah. think it'll be fun. And also, you know, I'm not, so philosophically bent against, you know, we're trying to be, to let research and logic and reason govern our recommendations. For sure. Like with people with calcium supplements. You have some people that are so anti-supplements that they'll bend over backwards to, and some people who want to give you high-dose supplements. Mm -hmm. You have all extremes. Right. You know, what's this, if a supplement can help you with something, what's the problem with taking a little supplement? It's, right. You know, they're, they're, well, okay, we know food, it's better to get certain nutrients from food. It's better to get vitamin E from food because there's eight different vitamin E fragments. Right. It's better to get carotenoids from food because there's a lot of different vitamins. But there's only one type of zinc. There's, you, know, you don't get a hundred different types of zinc from food. You're not going to, they, they blanketly think because it's better to get most nutrients from food than it's better to get all nutrients from food. Right, they're saying all supplements are bad. All like, supplements so are bad. People yeah. will write in and they'll be yeah. like, I thought like a, a multivitamin increased your risk of cancer. And yeah. I'm like, well, multivitamins have completely different ingredients in them. What are we talking about here? Yeah, which ingredient are we talking about? And yeah. and it's, I mean, you're very against folic acid and fortifying food with certain ingredients because you're like, that's been shown to be harmful. Right, and now but, we're talking about calcium. And just because taking a thousand milligrams of calcium can has a potential to increase cardiovascular risk of calcification of joints. So there's some too that- much calcium can too much calcium cause calcif calcification. In the heart. Oh, and, in the heart. And can cause, and can have negative effects from overly taking calcium, preventing against osteoporosis. Right. So it's like too much calcium, it literally builds up in our body. Yeah, you take too much at one time, it spikes the calcium in your blood too high. Got it. And so people will use that argument to say, we shouldn't take any calcium, just from what we give them food. Mm -hmm. But the studies show that taking a little extra calcium with meals, food-derived calcium in a low dose, like 200 milligrams of calcium with, with each meal, instead of 1,000 at one time. So the question is, should women, postmenopausal women, take some calcium to prevent osteoporosis? And the answer is they likely they should. Mm -hmm. But a low dose of food-based calcium to just increase the calcium content, because some of these women have low appetites, we're trying to have them not overdo calories, and they'll get some extra protection against bone, against hip fracture and osteopenia and then osteoporosis if they take a little extra calcium in their diet. More than what's in their multivitamin? Yeah, because it takes up room in the, in the supplement and the multivitamin, for example, my multivitamin, I think only has like 100 in it or something. Okay. And so, so what are you saying postmenopausal women should take? Well, I'm saying if they take like 150 to 250 milligrams of calcium with a meal or with two meals a day or maybe even three meals a day, they're not going to spike their calcium so high to create any benefit on their joints or their heart, or their heart yet they're giving that little extra calcium that's going to have an effect on the, protecting their bones. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying that calcium doesn't have beneficial effects, but I am recognizing that too much calcium can also have a negative effect. Right. So if you're going to take it, just take a little bit. It's that you sweet know. spot. So that, not yeah. the same case for men, though? Well, men have bigger bones to begin with and a bigger, stronger... They're bigger. not as at risk for osteoporosis. And, and they can gen not as have the same risk, and they're also... They can eat large amount of calories... So they can get their calcium just eating more food, bigger appetites. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? They just so they're... Do all vegetables have a pretty high level of calcium? I know broccoli. I feel like broccoli is where you get my head is having. Well, a lot. greens and beans have the most protein in them. Greens and beans and seeds have high calcium and high protein and high, you know. And the other nutrient we talk about with osteoporosis, besides vitamin D, which we talked about, is K2. Because mm -hmm. we get plenty of K1 from eating vegetables. Right. Tons. And the body's, the bacteria in the gut can convert some of the K1 into K2. But we know that taking K2 supplements 
prevents calcifications in joints, prevents calcifications in the heart, and increases bone mass. Mm. And so K2 Sounds supplementation, it's incredibly, the research is incredibly compelling. Mm -hmm. You know, so we don't have a blanket fear of taking any supplements, taking a little K, extra K2 mm -hmm. and a little extra calcium um, appears in the evidence we have at this point that seems um, um, very helpful and protective for women against later life osteoporosis. Oh, so, cool. So there's some, so a lot people can do right now to do, to do the right thing to be protective against when they get to be 90 and 100 years old or in great health. Because everybody will argue, oh, well, a vegan diet gives you enough omega-3 because vegans are not depressed, they're, not, they're still functioning. Yeah, they're still functioning until they're 80 years old, but if we're going to eat so healthily and we're going to push the envelope of longevity live to be 90 to 100, to live to be 100 years old, then it's between 90 and 100 that we're trying to protect the brain. Right. Then the diet doesn't have enough to be the optimal um, intellectual and mental faculties between 90 and 100 years old on that diet. You want to make it so it's going to have enough to, to keep you have full brain size into the, into the into maximizing human lifespan. So it's a whole different viewpoint that I'm teaching here than what other getting from other people. So do you know, I'm switching gears a little bit here. Do you yeah. know they're having what's called a golden bachelor? So they're doing the bachelor for a 71 year old man. Really? He's the bachelor. Oh, cool. He looks so young and so good. Whatever he's doing at 71 is like what he I want to be doing. He looks younger than me? I won't say that. <laughs> he I'm looks bright on, I know. I'm going to be 70 this year. That blows my mind too. In just a few months, I'm going to be 70. I'm right on par with you. Like, I mean, that's how I want to be at 70. That's how I want to be at 80. I, that's how I want to be at 90. Like, I just want to still be enjoying my life. And I'm just, I think all these opportunities to like learn, make little tweaks, it's fun and it's exciting. Yeah. And it gives you like a little confidence that you can have, take a little charge. I agree. Sure. I think that being a health nut like we are mm -hmm. is fun. You used to hate when I called you that. But it's uh, maybe, what, I, maybe I said health freak. So I don't remember any of that. But, but I'm saying yeah, yeah, yeah. A, a health, yeah. health nut. Health I mean, enthusiast. Health enthusiast. Health, yeah. yeah, like you, right? I mean, yeah, health, health nut. I, I like to t like pretend. I like to think I'm a little laid back about it, mm -hmm. but I still greatly enjoy it. Yeah, it's fun. It gives you more confidence in life. It gives yeah. you less fear of living yeah. and fear of the, of medical testing and medical profession and thinking you need more. There's you can nothing live without worse. fear. And, I hate and who wants to be in the, yeah. hate hanging out in a doctor's office. I don't even like the smell. I don't even want to go to. I say I don't want to go to doctors ever. I wouldn't even go to me. You say I don't that. Want to go to my, I don't want to go to myself. <laughs> <laughs> Stay away from myself. I don't even look at myself in the, in the mirror. <laughs> yeah, please. You have to hang out with yourself now. Yeah. Um, so, does vitamin D help with bone strength at all? I feel like you used to say that. Yeah, but we're, giving, we're making sure people's vitamin D is between 30 and 45 in the blood test. Right, right. And so you're we're saying already that adjusting will, the blood test rate yeah. for vitamin D. So that's given. Right. And we're using a but combination. It does, it does contribute to bone strength. Yes. And we're okay. given a combination of sun and supplementation. So we don't have to go too much supplementation either. Right. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. So to review, because I feel like I we learned we, a we, lot. We, got, we covered it. Yeah. But no, to review, because it was like mm. so much, um, physical sunscreen over chemical sunscreen, no sunscreen. Just enjoy your mornings, soaking in those red lights, right? Right. All the good stuff. Between nine in the morning. Yep. Five to before ten minutes nine. a day. Four nine in the morning. Five to ten minutes a day when the sun is high in the sky. Right. To let get that vitamin D. Supplement smartly. All the things you say. Eat a nutritarian diet. Do the damn thing. Go to bed early. <laughs> right. So you can get up early and get early morning sun. Yeah, I love that you're a big proponent of sleep. Sleeping yeah. is one of my favorite yeah. favorite activities. And you got to go to bed early so you can get enough sleep. Yeah. And still get up at six o'clock to get out when the sun shines. Mornings sun are shines. amazing. Yeah. They're lovely. Okay. Before we finish up, let's just answer one or two member questions. Sure. Okay. So members at drfirmer.com asked us these questions. Thanks for writing in. And first question, are juices, are juices and smoothies something we definitely should be incorporating into our nutritarian diets? Um, well, I don't have to incorporate them in my diet because I've been eating healthfully for so many years. I already have good levels of nutrients in my tissues. I don't need to try to get more nutrients and more um, vegetables into my diet. I already have enough. Right. But if I was just starting out on this way of eating and I had like high blood pressure or an autoimmune condition or asthma, then I'd want a juice or smoothie because my appetite wouldn't be enough to eat all that salad and all that vegetables. So I can get an extra much of vegetables in to get my levels up quicker because it could take a year for a person to get the levels of nutrients in their tissues up to where I am in my tissues. Right. And we increase the nutrients in our tissues by eating right and by keeping our weight down as opposed to your nutrients are spread out into the, your fat supply and doesn't get into your tissues. So yes, a juicing or even some smoothies can be helpful when people start out. 
and it's beneficial. Like they will give it will give us a little spike in our nutrients. They'll get the nutrients up quicker, higher, so they can their immune system can start functioning sooner, not wait six months to a year to get the nutrients high enough in their tissues. We can get them to otherwise consume more vegetables than they would have been comfortable eating by right. the, giving them juice. That makes sense. And I might have juice once or twice a week of beet and bok choy and carrot and a little lettuce or celery, just because it's fun, it's nutritious, it's healthy for you. All the good but things. I don't think I really, if I'm eating so super healthfully, you don't have to juice. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Okay. And then to piggyback off that, because I found this really interesting and you got me thinking about it, it's not worth it to green juice if it's not an organic juice. Oh, correct? absolutely. Yeah. I feel like that's, I mean, they sell a lot of green juices. Not everywhere is organic. No, and don't juice when you're not organic because now you're concentrating a lot of vegetables into your diet that you wouldn't normally eat. Mm -hmm. It's increasing your vegetable consumption, which is giving you like now you can eat an extra couple of pounds of vegetables and just you get it down without taking up much space in your stomach mm -hmm. and you increase your levels of exposure to to possible pesticides, or herbicides, or fungicides. Right, and you who know. wants that? Or cadmium, or natural toxins in food. Right. You know. Okay, so the next question, I think I have it off the top, is do artificial sweeteners sabotage your plans for a healthy diet and lifestyle? Yes. Why? Because they stimulate, even though they may not have calories in them, they're still stimulating the the addictive centers, the dopamine receptors, the opiate receptors in the brain, they're keeping you up on that bliss point of pleasure. And they keep the, they light the fire under your desires for sweets. They keep you continually desiring more sweets. Craving. And then they, craving, and they keep your taste muscle for enjoying the sweetness in a strawberry or the sweetness in romaine lettuce is not there for you mm -hmm. because you're constantly taking in things that are excessively sweet. You shouldn't be taking yeah. in things that are sweetened to high levels of sweetening because now you're going to be driven to keep your addiction going for sweetener even if it's not calorically and you want to eat more food in general and moderate levels of sweetness hit so right sometimes like a piece of super dark chocolate it's like it's rich delicious like all the nutrient desserts these desserts we make are not that sweet but but and you don't want to put too much sweet you don't but they're make... still delicious like yeah. they just hit so right to me and they don't make me yeah have that icky taste that likes craving more and more in my mouth they don't so have to be on that. a diet and say oh can you eat just one spoonful because it's so it's a dessert right. i can have a i can have a whole you know <laughs> take a, a whole scoop a whole yeah. a reasonable portion of it oh, yeah. it's not going to be so that sweet yeah and i, I much that. enjoy the so we're getting people to enjoy eating things that have more moderate levels of sugar in them so then they can enjoy natural foods more and they're not having to eat artificial foods to get hit that bliss point right Okay, last question. Mushrooms are obviously a G-bomb. Mm. Should we be eating mushrooms every single day? Yes, you should be eating more than one type of mushroom every single day. Okay. Not only should you eat mushrooms every day, but one type of mushroom isn't enough. Oh, wow. There's hundreds of varieties of mushrooms, and if you lived in primitive times, you would never be eating one type of mushroom. Mm -hmm. You'd be looking for the, you find 20 different types. There are hundreds Foragers. of mushrooms. You'd forage in the woods for 100 different types. So does a supplement count then? Like if I'm having a supplement or like your chocolate chaga, like a yeah. beverage with nine That's different mushrooms? That's why we have the immune biotech or the okay. chocolate chaga tea. Some people can take some extra mixed different types of varieties So you of actually mushrooms. recommend like really consuming that stuff. Different you, mushrooms. Different mushrooms. Every day. But I also recommend going to the high quality supermarket, mm -hmm. buying your shiitake mushrooms, mm -hmm. And then getting some of those more expensive mushrooms, the chanterelle, the oyster, the I pearl, oyster. the trumpet, these different mushrooms, it doesn't matter what they cost because you just a little bit of mushroom is super healthy for you. Even right. if you just eat a little tiny bit, even if you can't afford wow. it. So buy a little bit of mushrooms and have variety in your mushrooms. Spread them out. Spread it out over the week and get a little different types, even if it's a small amount. Wow. Even if it's expensive. So we could want that mushroom variety of organic mushrooms and don't care about the cost because you're not going to, if it's $14 a pound, then buy a quarter of a pound and add it to the weekly mushroom you're doing. You know? And if you're not a fan of mushrooms, dice them up so tiny, put them yeah. in that pasta with red sauce, put them in, dice them down, get them in there, bake them, do whatever you need, saute them, you can't use them. And you know what? New product we have at drfirma.com that I love. The forest mushrooms. Yeah, it's a bag of dried mushrooms, of dehydrated yeah. mushrooms. It's it so has, good. There's like what, mushrooms like cultivated in the wild with yeah. like black forest and all kinds of different mushrooms, black trumpets, and, and you just take the dried mushroom and I just, I like chop it a little bit and I just drop it into the hot soup mm -hmm. and it just adds the mushroom in the soup and I just I, I've been making a lot of Asian dishes with them and yeah. they all, each mushroom in that bag has like a different texture too yeah, so and it it's, soaks up the fluid and it has gets so those, cool those are really yeah yeah um, it's cool because you can make and you develop a taste for this stuff because when I was younger I didn't like scallion and mushroom but now I love this stuff because I'm used to eating it yeah oh it's delicious I've I feel like there's hardly a food out there that I don't really enjoy and love except for arugula, but that's a story for a different time. Yeah. And the fact that you know it's so good for you, it gives you that intellectual ability 
and you eat it when you regularly, so you know it's good for you. You see the magic and the wonder in the food. You can see right into it to see the magic it's doing for your body. Mm -hmm. So you can enjoy it even more. Right. So you're saying you, it makes you feel good. It makes you, it actually improves your health. And you actually have extra confidence knowing that you're eating all the good stuff. Right. Mushrooms are incredible. Longevity effects, anti-aging effects. People do anything for anti-aging. Why don't you just take mushrooms? Anti-diabetic <laughs> effects, anti-blood pressure effects, promote weight loss, yeah. reverse your diabetes. Yeah. These things are have magic in them. Right. But the nutritarian diet, the complete portfolio is where the real magic is. It's not just some garlic here, some ginger there, some mushrooms. It's really doing all of it together the, where you're really just punching in the anti, you know. A variety. Oh. Yeah, a variety of good stuff. You're just crushing it, basically. Yeah. So, awesome. All right. Thanks for joining. Great episode. Okay. Good work. Good work.